Welcome to Walden Pod. I'm Emerson Green, and my guest today is Nino Kadic. Nino is a third year PhD student from King's College London, and I wanted to talk to him about his presentation at the Science of Consciousness 2020 conference. The talk was called Dynamic Selves, an outline for a new type of panpsychism. We discuss his version of panpsychism, the biggest problem facing panpsychism, how he avoids that problem, Leibniz, continental versus analytic philosophy, the hard problem, and many other subjects related to consciousness. We kind of start mid-conversation, and just to clue you in, we were talking about our social media misadventures. I run a Twitter account called Daily Panpsychism, which is how we initially came in contact earlier this year. I hope you enjoy the show today. online and everything for yeah likewise you started the panpsychism facebook group right i do run the page and the facebook group yeah yeah i guess we can start here any minute but i just wanted to um ask you first because i think that we both have like a similar you know kind of issue with like new agey and like spiritualist stuff (laughs) have you have you figured out any way to kind of ward those people off ah well that was the result of many confrontations in the panpsychism group most recently, someone wanted to find a book connecting panpsychism to, like, hermetic uh, magic. <laughs> I, oh I was God. a bit kind of snarky, you know, I left a snarky comment, um, and then it, it escalated. But the, the point is, the, the way I kind of try to solve it is just, um, I have to approve every single post mm. that is posted in the group. And that kind of leaves, you know, gives me the space to filter out the more new agey stuff. No, I, I, I'm constantly like hiding replies and everything to the daily panpsychism account. Just the stuff that people mm. say to me is just like, like <laughs> I, it's just, some of it is just pure gibberish. And like, I can't figure, like, I don't get why panpsychism attracts these people like a magnet. Like, is it just the name or, or is it the actual well, idea or what? I think it's, it's probably the idea, you know, just because, this idea of a universal consciousness, I mean, that's how they see it at the very least. Uh, I guess it is very, you know, superficially similar to many of these um, new agey ideas about holism and cosmic consciousness and so on. So uh, it, it attracts that crowd as well. Um, yeah, I have a hard time, like, uh, like I've, I've tried to explain to people before, like I've tried to put down like my kind of skeptical or like former materialist credentials in a way where it's like, mm-hmm. look, I could not be less these people. OK, like I could <laughs> not possibly have le- I've never been into like woo stuff. I've like never been interested in any of that. Like the only sort of. Yeah, pseudo- same, yeah. yeah, like the only sort of pseudosciencey things I used to believe were kind of related to religion, like young earth creationism or something. But. Right. Yeah. Not like never have been interested in any sort of like, you know, new agey mysticism or anything like that. Like I just sort of when I first started being interested in panpsychism, I sort of viewed it as like a slightly modified form of materialism. And I don't exactly view it yeah. the same way today, but, you know, it can be viewed that way. I mean, I definitely didn't see it as anything new age or spiritual, to be honest. It's just it was just a very interesting theory of consciousness when I started to get interested in it so right so i brought you on today because i saw your presentation at the science of consciousness 2020 conference which was Mm. unfortunately held online this year due to covid Um, yeah yeah yeah, but it's still definitely i think we can agree the coolest consciousness conference right (laughs) i think someone called it the burning man of consciousness and (laughs) it makes a lot of sense even online so your talk was um, called Dynamic Selves, an outline for a new type of panpsychism. To get started on that, first I wanted to ask you, what is the biggest problem facing panpsychism? Well, I mean, I think most philosophers have it correct when they say that the combination problem is the worst problem. Uh, but I personally think the worst kind of the combi- combination problem for panpsychism is related to subjectivity. So. Uh, or the subject summing version of the combination problem, which is 
I think very much in line with William James's original idea when he said um, that if you put feelings, and that's how he called, you know, on one interpretation, either phenomenal qualities and on one interpretation, either uh, subjects. And so if you put them next to each other and each will kind of remain ignorant and windowless without any way of knowing anything about the other, right? So I think that's a, it, it is definitely, in my opinion, the subject summing specifically version of the combination problem as opposed to, you know, the combination of qualities and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for people who have never heard of the combination problem, let me quote uh, Keith Frankish here, who is a materialist and mm -hmm. obviously an opponent of panpsychism. There are many problems for panpsychism, perhaps the most important being the combination problem. Panpsychists hold that consciousness emerges from the combination of billions of subatomic consciousnesses, just as the brain emerges from the organization of billions of subatomic particles. But how do these tiny consciousnesses combine? We understand mm -hmm. how particles combine to make atoms, molecules, and larger structures. But what parallel story can we tell on the phenomenal side? How do the micro experiences of billions of subatomic particles in my brain combine to form the twinge of pain I'm feeling in my knee? End quote. So if you've never heard of the combination problem, that's, that's basically it. We're, if you think that consciousness or subjectivity or something of that sort is sort of brute and fundamental, then how do you combine all these tiny little subjects into the you know, bigger macro subject? that you are right now and and many people you know many panpsychists uh, also think that this is a big problem so i guess the easiest way to put it is how do subjects combine into more complex subjects right um and for example you have philip goff uh, who argued uh that, that, that we cannot see how micro subjects those small you know at the fundamental level how these small subjects could form a macro subject while Sam Coleman goes, I would say, and he's a philosopher from the University of Hertfordshire, I believe, um, I'll go a step further and he says that we can see how those small subjects could, could not form a macro subject. And that it's actually, you know, he can, it's demonstrably incoherent because perspectives, uh, you know, the point of view which you have on the world, they kind of exclude each other and they cannot be combined in a way which is which kind of preserves the original perspectives so he says that basically you have a case of strong emergence in this case and that's kind of precisely what the panpsychist wants to avoid because uh, the, the, we postulate panpsychists consciousness and as the, at the fundamental level of reality you know to get a sort of gradual picture of how it emerges at the higher level uh, and but so to avoid emergence, a strong emergence where something new kind of comes about from something which that didn't already have that property, right? So Coleman says that the combination, you know, the case of subjects combining would not avoid such emergence, right? So it's completely incoherent how subjects could combine. I, I kind of agree with him, sir. So I think that qualities can combine quite easily. I think that's a kind of quite intuitive notion. The idea of subjects, right, uh, you know, these points of view on the world combining, it just, you know, doesn't really make sense. So I don't quite get how combining subjects is outright incoherent. Like where mm, is it well, just because there are these like, you know, there's a point where my consciousness begins and yours ends and it's kind of it's not clear how those could sort of fuse into one point of view. Basically, yeah, because uh, for Coleman, and, and that's the argument I agree with, right? Um, a perspective is defined by, by what it excludes and what it includes, right? So if you have a perspective or a point of view on, let's say, red, and a point perspective or a point of view on blue, so the combined point of view of red, on red and blue, which will be, you know, will be kind of completely different. It won't, it won't have the same character. You know, having a perspective on blue and having a perspective of red on red and having a perspective on them together entails a very different phenomenal character. So it is not clear how the original point of view, which combined into this third one, were kind of, you know, how they were combined. Because it's, it, you know, it's not just a case of, you know, you put them together and you kind of preserve the same. When you put them together, you get a whole different perspective, right? And those perspectives seem to, ex uh, seem to exclude each other. So that's, I think that's the problem. I mean, when I first heard the combination problem, though, I, I didn't really get why it would be any weirder than, you know, different drops of water fusing together to form 
sort of one big drop of water or like multiple flames kind of being pushed into one mm-hmm. fire. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this, these kind of problems with perspectives combining, it's not like drops of water, because if you just combine two subjects in, into one larger subject, they are gone. You know, the first original subjects are just gone. So you just get an entirely novel subject, which is um, non-identical to the first two. And I think that's kind of Coleman's point as well. And and that doesn't seem to be anything like a intelligible, weak form of emergence, but rather a strong form of emergence, right. which the panpsychist tries to avoid. But there is also this more abstract, broader problem for panpsychism, and not, not even just panpsychism, just for philosophy of mind in general, but for panpsychism specifically. And it seems that we are using a very physicalist vocabulary um, and, and framework to refer to consciousness and subjects and selves and so on, right? So we, we say that subjects and qualities aggregate, combine, that there are properties of fundamental physical entities, uh, which also kind of places the conscious, places consciousness within the conceptual physicalist framework. And, um, and also because of that, it gives physicalists sort of resources to respond, right? Uh, because, if, for example, you have the phenomenal concept strategy, uh, which just says that we have two different sets of concepts that we use, phenomenal and physical ones, but claim that that doesn't lead to a conclusion that there's some sort of difference in ontology. Um, that you also have the global supervenience claim, which is uh, used to articulate at least a very minimal form of physicalism, uh, where consciousness could still supervene on the physical, even if we do not have a full explanation of how it does. So once you have the sort of physical properties in place, you also have the phenomenal properties in, in place, even if there is no clear explanation. But that's a very minimal physicalism, right? Mm-hmm. Could you take a minute to explain the supervenience idea to people who might not be familiar with that term? Mm-hmm. So the global supervenience claim uh, is the claim that, uh, how to put it simply, like once you have all of the physical properties kind of fixed in place, right, you will get the same kind of phenomenal properties also fixed as well, right? So they, they kind of, the higher level properties like consciousness fully kind of depend or are supervenient on the physical properties, right? So there can be no change uh, in those higher level properties without there being a change in the lower level properties. And it it kind of implies that there's nothing like ontologically new going on, right? Like it's just kind of weak emergence. Yeah, I mean, it's a very weak, you know, some philosophers think that this is not enough to categorize physicalism, uh, but some take it to be like a minimal form of physicalism. So Mm -hmm. If something can supervene on the physical, even if we don't have an explanation of how it does, uh, that, you know, still leaves the room open that it is just is physical, right? Right. So you could say that biology supervenes on chemistry? Yeah, I, could, yeah, I think okay. you could, could, yeah. That's a, okay. I just want to, because mm-hmm. I usually on this podcast, I use the phrase weak emergence to say, and mm-hmm. that's that's basically the same thing as supervenience, right? Well, I mean... Yes, uh, because in a, in a way, right? Because I guess weak emergence is fully intelligible, uh, but a, a global supervenience physicalist would say that even if it's not intelligible how consciousness supervenes on the physical, uh, it could still, you know, even if we don't have an explanation, it could still supervene on the physical, uh, and you know, just not imply anything other, being that it's anything else ontologically. Right, because like uh, with the subject summing problem we were talking about earlier, the the issue is that there's something ontologically new coming about when you fuse two subjects. It's not just like, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a new subject that's coming about and the old other two subjects go away. So there's something ontologically new, which is why we consider it a form of strong emergence instead of weak emergence, which is kind of what we were trying to avoid in the first place. So you know, we've done all this work and then we end up with strong emergence anyway. Um, yeah. But obviously there are some people such as yourself who have tried to circumnavigate that problem. But just to say one mm-hmm. word, though, in, in defense of, you know, emergentist panpsychism, I guess, even though I don't really subscribe to it to myself, I kind of have the same view as you where it's like this is kind of against the spirit of panpsychism. It does kind mm-hmm. of seem like a form of emergence that is not as problematic as experience 
emerging out of non-experience, because even though we have something ontologically new, we're, we're still staying within the realm of the subjective. So it's like we're going from the subjective to the subjective, as opposed to going from the objective to the subjective, which to me just strikes me as like, you know, getting something concrete out of abstract objects or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I mean... I think it's it is definitely true that I, I mean, and it at least it seems to me that emergentist panpsychism, like you say, is kind of less problematic uh, than emergence of the mental from the non-mental, right? But it, personally, you know, I just kind of it's not a very satisfying solution, I right, would say, yeah. right? And that's you know not really an argument. I haven't really thought much about emergentist panpsychism. It's just kind of like um personal preference to want to kind of, you know, tinker with these fundamental entities and try to figure out how to make a completely intelligible account, right? Right. Even if I failed, probably. <laughs> no, I, I share your dissatisfaction with um, emergentism. Um, but ju I just want to cover one last base before we get to um, the most popular answers to the combination problem. You mentioned the mm -hmm. phenomenal concept strategy earlier. Some physicalists have said, like, well, look, the reason it seems like there's a hard problem is because we have this concept of the mental and this concept mm -hmm. of matter. And, of course, it seems impossible that we could get one from the other. But, you know, that's just a problem with our concepts. It's not a problem with, yeah. you know, actual concrete reality. But the mm -hmm. thing that always mystified me about the phenomenal concept strategy is that they're sort of implying, if not saying, that well, matter has concrete existence. Like, matter isn't just a concept. Like, we have, you know, matter enjoys concrete existence, whereas, you know, the phenomenal is just a concept. And it seems like mm -hmm. they get that exactly backwards. <laughs> like, we know that the phenomenal has concrete existence, but we don't know that matter has concrete existence. Right, yeah. I mean, obviously, those are the kind of... Uh, the phenomenal strategy obviously only works if you if you are kind of operating within a physicalist framework anyways, right? So uh, even as a panpsychist, if you if you don't have this kind of consciousness first view, and uh, even some panpsychists don't, I think, right? Uh, because then it kind of seems very easy if you're, if you're already on this side, you know, we can doubt matter, but we can't doubt consciousness, right? To establish sort of panpsychism, but just kind of in a very technical manner. I think the point of the phenomenal concept strategy um, it's just to block this move from saying, you know, there's an explanatory epistemological problem about how to explain consciousness in physicalist terms and kind of prevent going from that to an, ontology, on, on, to, to, to an ontological problem, right? Saying that there is, you know, also such a bifurcation in, 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 in the natural world, in, in reality. So it's just kind of, I would say, a very good well, strategy, right, to kind of prevent a line of argumentation, right? And um, now, what are the background assumptions, you know, whether we should be focused epistemically first on consciousness or on matter? I think that's kind of a broader even question, right? Right. All right, so we've kind of set it up here, but what are the most popular answers to the combination problem that have been offered? The most popular answers. So. <laughs> In my opinion, I think um, a very interesting proposal was uh, uh, given by Philip Goff, um, who has this phenomenal bonding relation. And Goff argues that, um, you know, if you put sub micro subjects, small subjects uh, together, just their mere coexistence together does not necessitate that they will combine in the new, more complex subjects. And here he is following the kind of William James line, right? You put them together, each remains windowless, ignorant, and so on. Uh, but he says that they could stand in a relation which could lead to a more complex subject, and that uh, this relation might simply be a relation that we already identify. So, for example, some physical rela relation might have a phenomenal side, so to speak, that is responsible for phenomenal bonding. And something along these lines is also William Seeger's combinatorial infusion view, in which subjects um, merge or fuse in order to form a higher level subject. Uh, and this higher level subject then kind of subsumes or absorbs the mental states of these constituents. You know, so there is a relation again which allows for them to fuse, 
uh, without just their mere coexistence, you know, leading to a new subject. And uh, there is also preliminary work on uh, information and quantum mechanics, how they could provide a basis for consciousness. Like you have the Sieg William Seeger's view that also that quantum coherence, where particles combine to, to produce entirely new states, could explain mental states. Um, but like I said, I, you know, I think that this kind of Coleman style argument against perspectives combining also applies to both Goff and Seeger's view. So, you know, I have personally not come across a solution to the combination problem, which has really just, which has really convinced me. Uh, so I think that the combination problem really is insurmountable. So what do you think about um, a sort of deflationary approach to the combination problem where I've seen a couple panpsychists take this route, like um, not really formally that I've seen, but like, like I've seen Annika Harris talk about this. And I'm trying to think of who else might have mentioned this. I mean, I know I've mentioned it, but it's mm -hmm. just kind of the approach of saying, well, look, we're talking about the combination problem. Well, you know, what is a self or a subject? And what mm -hmm. is fundamental reality? Because like many presentations of the combination problem sort of presuppose an atomistic view of the world where we have mm -hmm. lots of little individual discrete particles little grainy bits, as Galen Strawson would say, you know, combining mm -hmm. to create these discrete, unchanging individuals. And, you know, those are highly contentious views of fundamental reality and the self or the subject, mm -hmm. if those are even the same thing. So the question is just like, you know, what's doing the combining and what's being combined into? And, you know, I'm not exactly holding my breath on like a widespread consensus on those questions. So like I said, I'm not trying to solve the combination problem here. I'm just saying that it seems kind of arrogant to reject panpsychism, you know, solely because of the combination problem, which seems to entail having some sort of definite answers to what is fundamental reality, like what's doing the combining and what's being combined into. And yeah. like I said, it, it seems to always, the presentation of the combination problem always seems to involve these like imagining like these little grainy bits, you know, these like little micro subjects, as opposed to, you know, the more modern picture of particle physics, which doesn't have anything to do with, you know, little grainy mm -hmm. bits whizzing around. It has more to do with like, you know, wave functions and, and fields and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think it's also one of the kind of ways to deflate the combination problem, in my opinion, is to first have a look at what we mean by the word subject uh, because you know subject and self are by no means clear concepts and there have been many formulations of the of them you know so for example you could define subject to mean just kind of a unified set of phenomenal qualities like a bundle in in the human terms and that alone seems to kind of deflate this notion that subjects are very discrete uh, and so on. Then again, the idea that perhaps phenomenal qualities are not essentially private could also deflate a little bit of the combination problem. You know, that the, the, there really is no way for for them to stop being windowless and ignorant, like James said, right? And actually kind of, in a sense, combine. But still, personally, I think, and not necessarily because I think it's not possible to for subjects to combine that there is no conceivable way of them combining uh, there might be right but i just want to kind of start from this perspective that it is not really you know promising or possible or coherent just to see what kind of panpsychism we can get following that line of thought right and also i think it kind of maybe maybe even could buy you some kind of credibility points from physicalists and people like that right because if you do say, yes, the combination problem really is a problem, right? And many ph philosophers, uh, including panpsychists, have argued that it is a really hard, you know, difficult problem. And then if you, I think it's a very power, powerful strategy if you just say, but panpsychism works even if you don't have the, even if you completely ignore the combination problem. And that's kind of what I try to do. So, okay, so you do have a sort of, would you consider it a solution to the combination problem? Like, how do you characterize the phenomenal routing? Oh, a, a way of avoiding the combination right, problem, right. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Avoiding. So, so what is phenomenal routing? Well, I, that's my idea, which I kind of inspired by 
Philip Goff, I mean, that, that's the name, phenomenal bonding, phenomenal routing. Uh, but also Le- Leibniz, Gottfried Wil- Wilhelm von Leibniz. I, you know, I, I also talk to many people, for example, like Luke Roloffs, who has this very interesting account of experience sharing and of between subjects unity. Uh, and it just it's a very weird idea, I will admit that, right? It's the idea of phenomenal routing now to kind of explain it. Is the idea that subjects, micro subjects, so small, small ones, fundamental ones, can stand in a relation so that they kind of share information about their phenomenal states with each other in a hierarchical manner, so that one of them becomes the dominant micro subject, which then kind of has access to the full experience of the group. And that's similar to this kind of Leibniz view of. Monads and uh, monads are discrete entities. He says that they are the true atoms of nature, uh, distinguished by the degrees of perceptions that they have. And he has this view that they never really interact, but they are structured in, uh, in 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 hierarchies according to God's will. So, which is you know pre-established harmony and so on. And but what's kind of more in line with my view is his idea, Leibniz's idea, that monads and their organic bodies can be structured in a way so that one of them becomes a dominant monad, the one which is kind of responsible for the actions of the organism and which which has clearer perception than other monads. Right. So he has this very complex hierarchy, and I think this is kind of very similar to my view because I say that you know your brain, to put it in a very simple manner. Let's say it's made out of like a billion micro subjects, and all they do, you know, they serve as sort of conduits or just empty emptiness, an emptiness or phenomenal space in which phenomenal qualities can be shared and are experienced. So they enable for this sort of hierarchy, which leads to phenomenal unity, and that phenomenal unity just then is me, right? So any micro subject who is at the end of the chain of this kind of phenomenal combination will be me. Because regardless, regardless of whether these, uh, this unified phenomenal state is experienced, it will be experienced as human, so to speak. So pretty crucial to your, to your avoidance of the problem here relies on that um, distinction you made earlier between combining qualities versus combining subjects. So Mm -hmm. your solution doesn't require any combination of subjects or any like subject summing, but it does require that qualities can sort of be routed to one, one dominant subject. Mm -hmm. So, well, I guess we've already brought him up, but, um, Leibniz, you you know, your dominant subject has a lot in common with the dominant monad in Leibniz's Mm -hmm. monadology. And, um, for those who don't know, Leibniz developed differential and integral calculus independently of Isaac Newton. And if you've mm-hmm. ever taken calculus, you've almost certainly used Leibniz's notation and not Newton's. But Leibniz also had, you know, really interesting metaphysical views. And some people disagree on, you know, whether or not he's a panpsychist. But in your view, was Leibniz a panpsychist? Hmm. I mean, in a sense, I think you could definitely call him a panpsychist because monads are, are these you know, building blocks of reality, and they have levels of perception and so on, uh, which can be kind of interpreted as consciousness as well. Um, But specifically, he was a pan-organicist, which is this term for the view that reality is structured by an infinity of monads and their organic bodies. So every single existing organism is, for him, kind of construed out of an infinite series of smaller or, let's say, you know, less complex monads right or these discrete atoms of nature and so on so but th- that view is in line sort of with panpsychism it just focuses more i'd say on the idea of life and organisms and the, the organic right mm. so it's a really unique and very different view w- from what we would find today so i have to mention that uh a, a good friend of mine and colleague uh tim bolens actually wrote a book um which kind of focuses on this kind of life-based approach to panpsychism. Um, right. Natural philosopher on Twitter. Yes, right. <laughs> natural philosopher. And uh, I'll just find the name of the book just, just so I don't mess up because it has like three parts. Uh, it's Life, the Universe, and Consciousness. Yes. 
if I understood his book correctly, there is uh, I mean, there is no no fundamental level of reality for him, right? There is just um, this kind of infinite, you know, decomposition of you know what he calls, I think, cells or these living entities which constitute everything. So I immediately actually messaged him when I read the book and said that this is very Leibniz, <laughs> and I think uh, it, that's that's just a compliment to his to his uh, work. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was I was kind of thinking of of Tim a little bit when I first heard about phenomenal routing because doesn't he have? I mean, he wrote that short paper like um, you know a short solution to the hard problem, mm-hmm. or it had a similar title. I think it's his pinned tweet, but um, it's very much worth reading. It's like two pages. But he mentions how he thinks there's basically one particulate subject that kind of is the locus of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, yeah, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the dominant monad or your dominant subject a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have discussed this, right? And um, I think, you know, our views are very similar, I would say. It's just that I guess his focus is more on providing a systematic philosophy um and you know just kind of to address many of the uh, intractable questions regarding reality and so on so his view is kind of more fleshed out in a sense because he focuses on life he also has this idea that uh, there is no fundamental layer of reality and uh, you know i don't focus on life nor do i have and i do think that there is a fundamental layer of reality and also, I don't try to kind of so provide a very systematic philosophy. I'm just really just focused on the subject summing version of the combination problem um, and kind of focusing more on these kind of conceptual issues with how to define subject, combination, selves, consciousness, and so on. So uh, there is even some kind of phenomenological influence behind my work. Right? right. You're a big fan of Husserl, right? Well, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> Husserl had this very complex but very interesting phenomenon. I mean, he started phenomenal, he and Brentano, Brentano and so on. Uh, but uh, he has this really complex and interesting idea of co-presentation, uh, in which aspects of an experience are not directly present uh, to, to the perceiver, but are sort of implied by the structure of the experience. And I think that could be a really interesting model uh, of how microsubjects can share these experiences so that one of them has, you know, a richer experience, you know, in a hierarchical manner. Uh, and I also had a really uh, interesting talk with Luke Roloffs, uh, who wrote an amazing paper on experience sharing uh, and between subjects as opposed to within a subject, unity. Right. So, you know, I, I what I want to say is that I'm not really alone. And uh, Tim, obviously Tim Bolens as well, but I'm not alone in this kind of attempt. My idea is not fully original, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. You know, but I think that's kind of a good thing. There is already literature, so to say, about aspects uh, of my theory. But so far, I think I'm the only one that kind of specifically wants to counter uh, the subject summing variant of the combination problem. Well, I which think probably we're... is the worst. Yeah. Obstacle for plants, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I think we're in agreement that the subject summing is, you know, the worst uh, mm. form of the worst objection to, worst as in, you know, the most persuasive objection to panpsychism. I actually wanted to quote something you said during your talk. It just kind of gives a nice overview mm-hmm. of phenomenal routing. Phenomenal routing is the idea that fundamental subjects can stand in a relation that enables them to share, route, reorganize, the phenomenal qualities that they instantiate in order to create a dominant fundamental subject. Fundamental subjects can relay information about their phenomenal contents into one specific fundamental subject, which then serves as Mm -hmm. the center of experience, thus enlarging its original phenomenal content. End quote. So, again, kind of the crucial point here is that we're combining qualities, not subjects, or we're routing qualities, and there's nothing ontologically new that happens here. Mm -hmm. so that's the advantage of it yeah i mean i think you know there are also even more possible ways of making this account even simpler for example you have michael ty who argues that we just have one multimodal experience as opposed to many experiences which combine uh which could lead to a view that both the subjects and their experiences are 
mirrorologically simple, right? Uh, this is not obviously compatible with my theory, but it's definitely an avenue I want to explore. And just this idea of that something can be more phenomenally complex, like a microsubject, which is literally just a you know a fundamental physical thing, right? Uh, can be more complex phenomenally or internally, so to speak, uh, I, without there being a physical change. You know, I think that's quite an interesting option. Uh, but it is also not necessarily the case that it is phenomenally more complex, right? Uh, it can just have access to the information of the entire system, being in a sort of privileged position within the causal structure. So uh, there are many ways, you know, kind of to spell out this theory and i haven't really decided which one is the best but to avoid potential objections uh i feel that i could write you know an entirely new phd thesis just on this because i see so many possibilities and there's also this interesting idea by giulio tononi and his integrated information theory where if you have many interconnected subsystems with a given value of phi which is his scale of um for measuring the complexity of integrated information or consciousness. So the total or the maximum phi of that system uh, will be the same, w w will be identical to the largest individual phi, rather than being just a combination or aggregate of all these values. So again, just emphasizing that there are philosophers who have worked on aspects of this, right? Uh, and I think they will be a basis in literature and in theory for maybe developing a feasible version of this theory, hopefully. There are so you mentioned potential objections, and you mentioned three potential objections in your talk. Um, mm -hmm. Only one of them kind of struck me as having any force, but I think you answered it pretty well, um, which was the neuroscience suggests that consciousness is not centralized in any one region of the brain, whereas your view mm -hmm. says there is a dominant monad or subject. So how would you answer that sort of empirical objection? My kind of go-to answer is just to say that the entire brain is truly is responsible for having these hierarchies of phenomenal qualities and then for routing that into one subject, right? So it's not just the case that everything just then kind of becomes that one subject. It, it has to be a part of that causal structure in order for it to play that role, right? So I don't think that, you know, there is actually any problem here. I think that kind of phenomenal structure will be likely, I think it's the best kind of starting point in terms of parsimony to assume that this kind of hierarchy of the phenomenal qualities is isomorphic to uh, the brain states and, and brain processing and so on. So I don't think I'm saying necessarily anything else, right? Anything kind of different from that. And if you look at the definition that I have of subject, of subjects, which is just a very empty, very, you know, nondescript kind of neutral entity, right? All I'm saying is that wherever there is the phenomenal unity kind of happens in the brain, that you will have, you know, it will be presented to a subject because all of them are just these kind of empty you know, fields of consciousness where the, to which things are presented. And phenomenal unity obviously happens in no matter what kind of, you know, theory of consciousness you have. You know, I don't think I'm really saying anything that out of line with the neuroscience. So your idea of a dominant subject doesn't really predict that empirically we would view something in the brain that appears to be sort of the centralized like, yeah, no, command no. center of consciousness. Yeah, not at all. So let's handle the other two potential objections you mentioned. The first one you mentioned was, where does the dominant monad slash subject go in the event of brain damage or death? In the same way that when, when brain damage happens, other parts of the brain uh, kind of take on some of the roles from the damaged part in, in, you know, sometimes, but, so, but the thing is, I think that just, it's, the, 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 there's a difference between two versions of my theory. One of them is what I call static panpsychism. And that is the kind of view that is being attacked here, uh, which is just a very literal understanding of my theory that there is one specific particle in the brain, which is always the center or locus of consciousness. And I think that's just, you know, obviously false. I think that's just not even worth considering. 
And then you have the, what why I call it dynamic panpsychism, right? You have this idea that each of them can play that role, right? Because they are, like I said, I describe subjects as a very neutral, empty, nondescript category, right? So any of them can play the role of just providing the phenomenal space for this kind of unity of qualities to happen. So when a part of the brain gets damaged, any other microsubject could just continue, you know, take over that role, so to speak, right? This is actually something that's just kind of related to panpsychism generally. Sometimes people will ask, like, you know, does panpsychism have any bearing on, like, this question or that question? And, you know, the afterlife is one of those, you know, mm-hmm. things that people bring up, like, does panpsychism imply that there might be, you know, an afterlife? And huh. you can guess what I think about that. I mean, you know, like I said, I've, I think it's just basically, like, first of all, it's a form of monism. So once your body dissolves and, you know, is kind of scattered to the winds, it's like you mm-hmm. are gone. You know, even though consciousness is still um, present, like your specific emergent form of consciousness, yeah, I don't necessarily mean strongly emergent. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying yeah. your subject. The structure is gone. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, you know, on panpsychism, I just don't see how there's any possibility for an afterlife where you personally survive. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I fully agree with you. I don't, I mean, if I had to kind of think about how panpsychism could support an afterlife, that would only, that could only be possible if I guess there was like a really, the, the whole universe was, you know, a, un, a, a mind, a conscious universe would be a mind. But then you have so many problems with like identity and it just doesn't seem, you know, that's just not panpsychism then anymore. That's just panpsychism plus, plus many additional claims that would make it possible for some sort of consciousness-based afterlife, right? Um, so I don't think that's very likely. Uh, but I think if you really want a sort of panpsychist-like theory, which could potentially you know, support the idea of some sort of afterlife, not necessarily a, a religious one, but just persistence after death. Perhaps cosmopsychism could be, I think, more amenable uh, to death, right? Because then you would still have to argue that the cosmic mind is something sensical <laughs> rather than just being Manichaean, you know, or just completely disorganized and disunified. Uh, but it's, you know, it kind of less claims to make, I would say, than trying to build up panpsychism in, into this, you know, spiritual, I would say, theory. So moving on to another objection, um, is your idea similar to the idea of a homunculus where there's sort of this, where, where you ask like, well, what explains human psychology? And then, you know, you might say, well, there's a little man in your head pulling all the levers. And then the obvious question mm-hmm. is, well, what's in his head? And then it leads to this infinite regress of explanation. So does your view involve a sort of infinite regress of homunculi? Well, no, uh, because I think that kind of problem, even though I anticipated it, uh, I think it's not really a problem because it's just a very different ontology, right? So you have fundamental subjects, right? And they are the fundam, you know, that's kind of where the line stops. You just have fundamental subjects. That's all that exists, really, right? Uh, And there is no need really to postulate the inner complexity in a sense of that subject because it just depends on the whole causal structure. You know, you don't need to postulate another layer of, you know, the dominant subject, which can then be explained like that. Mm -hmm. So d- does Leibniz's version, is is his sort of subject to that? Because he does believe in some sort of infinitely Infin- recursive... Yeah. yeah, doesn't he think, on Leibniz's view, isn't there a, an infinite regress of monads? Like he just mm. embraces that? Yeah, there is. Yeah. I never, oh, I don't so get do you, how... Are you asking what? Oh yeah, I was just asking your opinion about that because I just, I don't get uh-huh. why he uh, embraces that. It seems like a problem, not really something to be embraced. Well... Honestly, I have no idea why it is an infinity, right? Uh, But I think, you know, think about it in an analogy to Spinoza, for example, because for Spinoza, you had one substance, but with infinite, uh, with an infinite amount of attributes and modes of these attributes, right? With Leibniz, you have just an infinity of substances. (laughs) And uh, they, they, they have like, you know, they're different, differentiated by the attribute of perception. 
just one attribute basically, right? And then structured by God. So no idea why he needs it to be infinite, but that might just be my lack of understanding of Leibniz, to be fully honest, right? Um, his kind of view also includes God, right? <laughs> so it might not be the most outlandish thing to have a, you know, infinite regress or in just an infinite number of monads when you have already presupposed the existence of God, right? Right. <laughs> and, um, and also nowadays, I think this idea that there is no fundamental level of reality is becoming more and more popular, and, and it's kind of similar to this idea, I would say. Okay, so what do you mean when you say there is no fundamental reality? I've kind of heard people mention that, but I'm not entirely sure what that could possibly mean. I don't see how it's possible to avoid. I mean, even on like priority monism, there's fundamental reality in a sense. You know, there is, again, Tim Boland, a natural philosopher on Twitter, thinks that there is no really reason to believe that there is a fundamental level of reality because that just seems, for him, I, I, I believe, uh, if I understood him correctly, you know, there's just that kind of assumption we make about the world without true evidence so far. And he also says something like, you know, if the universe can be uh, infinite in other ways, for example, in terms of time or expansion and so on, why could not could could it not be, you know, infinitely divisible, right? And you also have again these kind of priority ontologies like priority monism and priority cosmopsychism. Uh, which either can or can, you know, the urge, I, I would say they're kind of neutral on whether there is a fundamental level, a smallest, uh, the smallest level of reality, right? Uh, because for them, the fundament, the, the fundamental level of reality just is the whole, right? Right. Uh, rather than the parts. So they're kind of ontology neutral, I would say, about the lowest level of reality. Um, so, I, you know, there are ways of maybe perhaps arguing against this idea of a smallest level, because th th that idea does kind of lead to some problems like combination and blah, blah, and so on. But honestly, I personally think you have much worse problems in terms of intelligibility and the world being, you know, graspable and so on, uh, if you have just an infinite uh, case of division and so on. Right. I mean, like, I just don't, I can't, like, really positively imagine what that would be, whereas just positing some kind of primitive or fundamental, you know, sort of bedrock just seems kind of unavoidable. But, you know, maybe I'm just not using my imagination yeah. there. No, I mean, I agree with you, especially now with the kind of new developments in physics. And you have basically the view that it's just one fundamental layer of reality, you know, like fields and waves and whatnot, right? Uh, I won't pretend that I understand it, right? I, I, but I, I believe what it is implying is that there is no really, you know, strict division, distinction, be, distinctions between entities at the fundamental level. So, you know, talking about them being infinite and just doesn't seem to be very convincing, you know, if you take into consideration the knowledge that we have nowadays, but also more philosophical worries about infinite regress, intelligibility, and so on. So I agree with you. I personally cannot, like, think about it, kind of cannot come to a positive conception of it, right? So when did you first become interested in panpsychism and, you know, like, what were your views before? Well, before I was, interestingly, before I was into ethics, mostly, right? So during the first two years of my undergraduate studies, I was like into ethical, uh, social, political philosophy, things like that. I wasn't even interested in consciousness. And part of the reason is because my undergraduate uh, study in, in Zagreb, Croatia, was just fully continental philosophy, right? So that's kind of, they kind of steer you in a direction which is more, you know, applied philosophy, let's say, or more political and so on philosophy. Um, also, I was into Greek, ancient Greek philosophy, things like that. Uh, and then on the, I believe, the third year of my undergrad 
I started reading about thought experiments in philosophy of mind. And I had this uh, a Mind a Brief Introduction book by John Searle. That was, I think, one of the first books I read about consciousness. And John Hyle's Introduction to the Philosophy of Mind, which is kind of like a textbook, right? So after reading those, I was just very interested in, in philosophy of mind. It just dropped everything else, basically. Mm. And uh, took a course at a different faculty, which had analytic philosophy in philosophy of mind and got an A. So I was really kind of motivated, right? And just panpsychism came later on, I would say, right? While I was first considering just pure physicalism, honestly, but it was just very unsatisfactory. And I just couldn't see how you could fit consciousness in, um, you know, into the physicalist third person kind of nomic vocabulary. Uh, and then I started, you know, kind of property dualism, exploring that, uh, neutral monism. And then I came across panpsychism and it was just kind of makes, made sense. You know, I may, maybe it's saying about, uh, something about me that the theory which most people find counterintuitive and crazy to me just immediately snapped, you know, just, yes, this is it, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I applied to CEU, Central European University in Budapest to work with Philip Goff, and that kind of, you know, fortified my desire to do panpsychism. Yeah, I mean, I had the, a similar experience where I've, I've read about uh, panpsychism from Thomas Nagel and his essay called Panpsychism, mm -hmm. and I wasn't immediately convinced, but I was just like, I was really interested in it, and I was like, wow, this actually mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. It's obviously ridiculous, but I can't really see why this is wrong. <laughs> and um, you know, I just yeah. kind of, uh, I was like, well, the only problem I can really see with this is that it's unfalsifiable and, you know, that's kind of a red flag, but it's not like a knockdown argument really. And I was just mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, like it just kind of bothered me that otherwise intelligent people could believe in panpsychism and I couldn't figure out why it was wrong. So I kind of <laughs> just kept, you know, it just kind of stuck in my crawl a little bit and I kept looking into it and then, um, I ended up being persuaded by the advocates for panpsychism and it yeah. kind of it left me with no cognitive dissonance in a way that physicalism always left me with cognitive dissonance you know like i had this intuition mm -hmm. that the hard problem really was a hard problem but i had kind of taught myself to suppress that intuition just being like well you can't trust your intuitions all the time like but that that was basically all i could do was just kind of you know maybe explain how other things emerge and say well consciousness is probably like mm -hmm. that and then just kind of suppress you know the intuition that there is some kind of gap here that is not being covered. And uh, yeah, panpsychism just is really, it doesn't seem weird to me at all. I was just, I was actually just talking about this the other night where, like you said, how it says something about you that, you know, this thing that everyone else thinks is <laughs> counterintuitive and crazy just kind of clicked for you. You know, it kind of, mm -hmm. I feel the same way. Like, you know, when I see like Philip Goff wrote that article, that's, um, pretty widely read of just like, I think it's called panpsychism is crazy, but it's most likely true. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, you know, he's doing good philosophy communication there because he recognizes that it sounds crazy to most people, but it is disingenuous on his part because it doesn't sound crazy to him. Like it doesn't sound crazy to me at all. Like it, it's, to me, it's kind of weird that people think it sounds crazy. It's like, this just seems like mm -hmm. a, slightly unorthodox metaphysical view but it's not crazier than materialism or neutral monism or anything yeah uh, i mean if you look at the history of panpsychism throughout western and not just western but also i mean if you couldn't call it panpsychism but elements of panpsychism at the very least uh, in even you know eastern philosophy it, it's not a you know it's not an uncommon view in, in, in any way i mean some of the most important philosophers at the very in, in the West, at the least, uh, at least were, you know, panpsychist or panpsychism like, you know, right. like like we said, we mentioned Leibniz already. Spinoza for it could be construed as a panpsychist. You know, there there's just perhaps even Schopenhauer. You know, I think there are many kind of independent strands of thought which are inspired by panpsychism. You know, all over the world, really, and. You know, to me, it just doesn't seem to be a very odd view. It's just odd based on the conceptions and 
uh, based on the kind of accepted knowledge that we have nowadays. Right. And you, uh, you mentioned something earlier that I found fascinating. You said that continental philosophy is dominant in Croatia? Oh, yes. I mean, at the, in my in Zagreb, yes. In, in Rijeka, which is the coastal, uh, which is a coastal city, it's just fully analytic. But in, in Zagreb, Croatia, at least the faculty where I was, it was continental. The other one was like religious Thomist, uh, and the third one was it used to be analytic. Now it's well, let's not talk about. It. Okay, <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, all right. I'll, I'll back away slowly from that one. But um, but there was a. <laughs> I mean, so is is it just specific to like different universities? Because I suppose we have that in the U.S. as well, where it's like there are some schools you can go to where like continental philosophy is more dominant, but overwhelmingly, like analytic philosophy is just it's just like i it's probably like 90 10 you know across like universities mm. in the u.s yeah but i mean if you look at the history of croatia you might start to kind of see why continental philosophy especially these kind of marxist and uh, uh socialist left-wing strands and the critical school and so on uh critical theory sorry frankfurt school so on uh, they are very influential because we you know we were a socialist country <laughs> um and I think that kind of deeply entrenched itself into, at the very least in Zagreb, in, my, in, in the capital of Croatia. Right? And uh, Rijeka really is the outlier because they are fully analytic. And I think they are, uh, not just because of that, but just in general, the best philosophy department that we have there. Um, but some of the kind of, you know, I, and I'm not saying I have anything against necessarily socialism and things like that, but it is more tied to continental philosophy, I would say. So that kind of explains why those departments are still continental nowadays, right? Right. More like an Austria-Germany connection and the kind of um, of the cultural influence, I would say, than, than the Western kind of UK and USA influence, I would say. I do kind of wish, though, that continental philosophy had a little bit more of a hold in the U.S. where not so much the content, but just the uh, kind of more of an emphasis on the form and the aesthetic value, which seems to be like largely absent from analytic philosophy. Like it's a lot of analytic philosophy is just like bad writing. Not all of it. There, <laughs> there are good, you know, there are analytic philosophers who are good writers. Like uh, I think Galen Strawson is like an excellent writer. Um, and I think he mm -hmm. is technically an analytic philosopher. but. Um, yeah, like by and large, it seems like in continental philosophy, there's more of an emphasis on like sort of the form, you know, in the sense of it, it actually matters, mm -hmm. like the aesthetic quality. And there's not very much of an emphasis on that in analytic philosophy. It's just kind of very, very dry and unreadable. Yeah, sometimes. sorry, that's what I meant to say. Like it's just kind of clarity, I guess. Analytic philosophy is all about like going through every single detail and argument and spelling it out. And you have these very long, dry texts. Uh, but in the end, they end up kind of contributing because they do, you know, go over this huge set of possible objections and really spell out the problem, right? Which I think makes it kind of easier to operate within analytic philosophy, right? But continental philosophy is just more inspiring, to be honest. Like, right. you know, if you read existentialists and, and, and phenomenologists and all of that, they have these, you know, grand theories about the human condition and consciousness and all of that. Like, that, you, you, you know, that's what you, you will put kind of on a quote or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of more, it sounds more wise, right? And I think... Any philosopher, really, who is interested in any topic should really look at both sides of the story. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do, because recently I've been starting to get into phenomenology, for example, a bit more because I want to understand their take on consciousness and then combine it with the analytic one. But not just, you know, also outside of the Western kind of sphere of philosophy. I think there are many philosophers just tend to disregard any other tradition. Like analytic philosophers disregard continental and Eastern philosophy, for example. Continentals just have, you know, really negative stance, I would say, towards analytic philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I think at, at an individual level, every philosopher should really kind of engage with both because that's just better scholarship, to be honest. I think one day we will finally go over this division, you know. Yeah, I that, hope so. That would be nice. I mean... It 
Because I think that, I mean, in my own opinion, I think philosophy is something that should be sort of for as many people as possible and not just restricted to academia. And like you said, like continental mm-hmm. philosophy is often just more inspiring and quotable and people take it as more relevant to their lives, even though in some yeah. ways it's less rigorous. I mean, it's, it, it is rigorous in its own way, but um, it's just kind mm-hmm. of diff- And the thing is like, bad continental philosophy is truly hard to read and is you know you know the (laughs) continental philosophy at its best is incredible but um you Mm -hmm. know bad continental philosophy is i think a special kind of hell (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i mean you know it's so it's such an interesting question really but sometimes it's very obscure right at least many people say that for example hegel is obscure (laughs) and um but I sometimes think that maybe some concepts simply are just very obscure and that, that you cannot really clearly write about them or that you kind of miss the point. You don't really illustrate the entire, you know, the thing that you're trying to describe if you just simplify everything down. So some concepts like, you know, the Sartre and the the, uh, the Posoi and the Ansoi, I don't know if I'm mispronounced, <laughs> so, but um like, you know, humans being undefined as opposed to the external world being defined, it's not obviously clear what he means, right? But in a sense, it's intuitively very clear what he means, right? So being, which is outside, which has a, you know, set of characteristics which are completely transparent in a way, and us, on the other hand, nothingness, right, which doesn't. And again, maybe I don't understand Sartre enough, but to me, those ideas kind of resonate almost at a, in a different way than just rational comprehension, right? So I think there is something significant in con- continental philosophy, which is lacking in analytical philosophy. But there is also something in continental philosophy, which is lacking from analytical philosophy, and that would be you know, just accompanying these, you know, huge ideas with clarifications and arguments right? where it can be, you know, clarified and argued for. So I wanted to ask, because I think that Galen Strawson is kind of an excellent synthesis between, you know, those two schools where he does kind of connect mm-hmm. the conclusions of his analytic philosophy with real life. And he does put it in a really poetic, aesthetically satisfying way. So I think that Galen Strawson is probably like my favorite living philosopher for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But I wanted to ask you, like, who are some of the philosophers who are kind of important to you? Well, I would also, Galen Strawson, definitely. I mean, I really enjoy his work. And, uh, you know, it, it was one of the first kind of uh, arguments for panpsychism, which I read, and it just still continues to influence me, really. Also, Philip Goff, you know, but I'm kind of biased, obviously. <laughs> Philip Goff was my supervisor, and, you know, that's just um, many positive feelings towards him as my previous supervisor. But I do think that he introduced some really interesting and helpful concepts, and he, his academic book is really an excellent uh, book on panpsychism, you know. Uh, just a lo- lots of respect for Philip Goff. Um, but I would have to say that my favorite probably living philosopher would be Thomas Nagel, right? Because I think his work on perspectives and objectivity and subjectivity is also a case where perhaps not necessarily explicitly, right? But where he kind of combines these intuitions which are present in continental philosophy, like phenomenology, for example. Uh, into a really readable and clear and uh, just academically rigorous text, right? So, for example, you know, here just like one very concrete example of what I mean when I say that it's connected, right? So he says, Nagel says that there is a tension between us being a specific point of view within the world and just being a kind of one of the many objects within the universe. So this tension between the objective conception of us and the subjective conception of us, right? Uh, I think that's just a really, you know, really similar to the formulation uh, to to Husserl's paradox of subjectivity, which is basically the same really thing, you know, like you have this subject, transcendental ego, right? Which is the condition for experiencing as such and the condition for us applying an objectivist framework on the world. 
And then you have us just being a part of that world and that framework. And there's a tension which is almost seems, you know, impossible to solve. And um, so Thomas Nagel, you know, just <laughs> I really love his work because I think it's just, you know, academically excellent and rigorous and informed by many different traditions. And he just has these really, really extensive writings on so many topics, which which just, again, continue to in, inspire my work as well. So, Yeah, I love Thomas Nagel. He, I mean, like I said, he's the one who kind of got me um, interested in panpsychism to begin with. But the first time I heard of him was mm-hmm. just kind of his famous characterization of, you know, what is interesting about the mind-body problem and, you know, what makes the hard problem hard in more modern parlance of just the, um, you know, in his, like, what is it like to be a bat paper and in, like, many other papers where he, I think, really brilliantly articulates, like, like why even is there a mind-body problem to begin with? Mm-hmm. I find that a lot of people, they all they can really do is claim to not share the intuition. Like, they they don't really, I haven't really heard anything convincing about how on earth you could get, you could just pile on enough objective descriptions and eventually get a subjective description. All they can really do is just say, oh, I don't really share that intuition. I don't really get it. And um, mm-hmm. yeah. I think that Thomas Nagel, I just find Thomas Nagel so much more convincing on that issue. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. yeah. How, by the way, how do you deal with that? I've, I was just talking to someone on Twitter the other night about, um, I quoted Thomas Nagel about, I think the quote was something like, no objective description or analysis of the nervous system will ever by itself imply anything which is not objective. And um, a friend of mine replied and said, mm-hmm. He's like, look, I get the point, but how do you prove that? Like, how can you give a non-question begging argument? And I was just kind mm. of at a loss because I was like, how, I don't really feel any pressure to make an <laughs> argument for that. It just kind of seems like, like I said earlier, it seems Obvious. like getting, yeah, it seems like a category mistake. It seems like, you know, why can't you get concrete objects out of abstract objects? And it's like, because they're just different things. You just can't do that. I, I'm just kind of at a loss when people don't share that intuition. Obviously, I also share the intuition, right? I think that just, but starting just from epistemology, I don't think, you know, the concept, the, the set of concepts that physicalists have, third person kind of nomic mathematical concepts and so on, just you know, epistemologically, I don't think it can explain consciousness. And that's just an end, the end of the story for me. You know, I, I fully agree with the intuition that, you know, no set of physical facts like the one about the brain will imply knowledge about consciousness, right? Uh, or will, you know, about phenomenal consciousness better, you know, uh, kind of right. better to express it in that way. But kind of to play devil's advocate, right? I think... Um, and this is just like science fiction, <laughs> but if you just imagine like a science hundred thousands of years from now when we have, you know, warp speed and things like that, there just might be another layer of reality which will just be fully subsumed or exampled uh, or um, fully subsumed or and explained, sorry, in physics of that age, of that future age, and in which we will find that consciousness just kind of resides, right? <laughs> or, uh, I, I, I thought about what that kind of layer of reality or physical entity might be. And I, this will sound really stupid, but the, the best analogy I had to it was subspace in Star Trek, if you watch Star Trek. So subspace is like, you know, subspace, <laughs> like an additional layer of space through which information can travel and so on. Uh, and, you know, it might be the case that, you know, this kind of internal representation of phenomenal states to an observer might be ex- explained by some new physics, which is just so beyond our current concepts, uh, we just can't even imagine what it, it would be, right? Uh, but whether that physics will have anything kind of in common with this current physics is just very it's it's hard to say honestly and i think that it's just a hope that physicalists might have right if they're honest about consciousness being you know problematic to explain uh but currently we just don't have any indication that there is such an explanation right but like i say anything is possible on this right you know yeah i think that's what karl popper called um promissory materialism 
where it's like, well, look, mm-hmm. obviously <laughs> physicalism and materialism are true. And like, we can't explain consciousness, but like, it's just a matter of time. We just need to try harder. And, you know, once we just look at even more objective explanations, we'll eventually cross the divide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just strikes me as kind of a non-starter where I'm tempted to just say, you just don't get it. Because there are plenty of people, by the <laughs> way, who are physicalists who do share the intuition. And there are plenty of people who are non-panpsychists who get the intuition. And I, like I said, it just... Mm-hmm. Plus just, I mean, the general, it might just be my personality, but like the, the disposition of like Churchland or Pilucci is like kind of frustrating to me and they almost seem mm-hmm. like not worth engaging with on a certain level. Well, I mean, I think that Massimo Pilucci and uh, Fisher Churchland, Paul Churchland, and maybe Dennett, people like, you know, philosophers who subscribe to some sort of eliminative or reductive mm-hmm theory you know i would kind of be honestly a bit more charitable (laughs) towards them right because i think that maybe they really you know honestly maybe they just don't have that intuition maybe they see that they have many different arguments for how it might be mistaken and so on and they might be convinced by those arguments right and also i guess this kind of drive or desire for everything being you know intelligible at least eventually um, I think is at, at that at a personal level can be as motivating and as kind of you know enchanting as as the idea that you're discovering something which is missing outside of you know in, in our picture of the world, right? So, and like I said, I'm fully open to the idea that some you know future physics in two million years from now on, right, uh, will be it won't be even an issue you know? maybe maybe this kind of perhaps right but like i say whether that will be the physics as we define it today or something entirely different whether that physics will entail panpsychism for example you know that's an open question and we can only you know work from the position where we are at now so you know i think there might be hope. And I, I personally think that there will be a next theory that will kind of supersede panpsychism, honestly, right? And that theory might be somewhere in the future, right? Well, where these intuitions between the physical and the non-physical and consciousness being sort of on the fundamental level in order to explain the picture, right? I, maybe those dis- distinctions will just be kind of left by something along the lines of a neutral monist or an information-based account or something in the future, right? like I say. Just pure speculation, right? But at least, at the very least, I am open to the idea that physics, no matter how it looks like in, 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 in the future, might just solve consciousness, right? I am open to it. I will be happy about it. You know, we will have an intelligible picture of the world. But just looking at the current state of uh, philosophy and science i think you know we don't have that solution and we have to start with some alternatives which might lead to a physics which has solutions or to a uh, change you know in a paradigm uh, in, in terms of how we approach the world right right because i was going to ask you i mean are you kind of assuming that there will be like major paradigm shifts in science where the word science might denote something a little different, like sort of, you know, along the lines of Philip Goff's imagined sort of revolution in science where we need Mm -hmm. to sort of reconceptualize science in order to explain consciousness? Like, are you saying that a future physics that is somewhat reconceptualized could solve the problem of consciousness? Because it seems to me that, like, science, like as we define it now, is sort of in principle incapable of fully explaining consciousness. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm fully open to that possibility. I wouldn't say anything definitive, right? Because obviously I can't imagine the you know, civilizations thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years from now on, right? And right. how that science might even look or what we even, you know, maybe we just scratch the surface of, of, of physical reality. Maybe, maybe there's like millions of other layers in which, you know, which might explain consciousness fully. And that kind of super physics uh, will, might, might be able just to explain consciousness without anything else. But would that super physics, as I call it, be even recognized as physics or as science from, from our perspective now, right? 
by some, you know, if it's done by some future humans who have like 500 IQ and are <laughs> developed to some, you know, uh, point, I, you know, I don't think it, it's just a highly problematic, right? We, obviously, now we see, we think that it's in principle impossible, right? But it, we think that partially, I would, uh, you know, kind of again playing devil's advocate, right? Because we just have, and I presume we have, a very limited knowledge of reality still. So one day, will science be able, whatever that science looks like, be able to explain consciousness perhaps, right? But maybe, you know, introducing ideas which are kind of similar to panpsychism and uh, such theories might just play a part, right, in, in that science or in getting us to that science. Right. So I'm kind of open to it. So, I, I mean, I can't help but ask because you mentioned, you know, civilizations in the far future. Are, are you optimistic that there will be a civilization in the far future? Because that seems um, <laughs> unlikely to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, this year wasn't a good one. <laughs> but no, I am fully optimistic. You know, I think people went through even worse. And I think we will overcome, honestly. But I'm inspired by <laughs> Star Trek, right? Because I'm just such a fan, honestly. <laughs> and um, that's just kind of the vision of future I grew up with watching. And I kind of believe in it, even if I'm fully irrational or even if the world is just depressing. But I, I still believe, you know, there will be like a post-scarcity, post, you know, post-money kind of equality based future society with a prime directive and all of this you know just kind of very optimistic that that is very optimistic i'll give i mean like it it definitely i just felt a warm feeling wash over me when you were saying that i was like wow i've never yeah. <laughs> i haven't heard anyone say anything remotely optimistic i think in like a year <laughs> same yeah <laughs> but i i'm generally a very optimistic person right so oh, okay you know, I, I, I guess I just looking at the history that we've had, I think we went through worse, you know, speaking of the situation today, and I think we will overcome and, you know, hopefully emerge even stronger you know, and more intelligent, more, more knowledgeable about. Hmm. I mean, and just to be clear, I'm not even just talking about like Trump or something. I think our problems are like decades deep and like just absolutely nothing to me at least seems to indicate that we are even attempting to solve them or steer ourselves in a sustainable direction i remember it was kind of you, funny you, oh go ahead no no just asking do you mean in the u.s or globally well in the u.s especially but globally as well mm -hmm. yeah i'm i'm an american so the u.s is just the whole world in my mind but <laughs> <laughs> But um, Galen Strassen. What, what did you want to say, sir? Oh yeah, uh, Galen Strassen. During an interview on um, the Pan Psychast, someone I can't remember how the question was posed exactly, but they were just like, "Are are you optimistic about humanity's far future?" And he was like, almost just like flabbergasted that they asked. He was just like, "No," <laughs> like almost just like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was blown away that that was even like a serious question. He was like, "Oh no, no, we're at the yeah. end." <laughs> No, but I mean, you know, maybe I'm just naive and I wouldn't compare myself to someone like Galen Strauss, but I do have a very personally, you know, I just kind of a vision, I guess, of in my mind of some nondescript, undefined future where things will be better <laughs> just in general. Right. Yeah. And maybe I'm just naive, but that's just kind of how I function, I guess. No, I, I don't think you're naive. I just I don't. um I just personally don't see the path there, I guess. Like I can, like I, uh -huh. I could imagine a few paths there, but I just feel like we've just continually missed exit ramp after exit ramp on this particular road we're going down. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, I didn't say it's in the near future. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a hundred thousand years. Well, I think we should end on that optimistic note. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciated it. And, um, I'm more and more persuaded by your um, phenomenal routing idea the more I think about it. Oh, well, thank you, yeah. And thank you for having me. You know, I, this was a, for my first podcast, right? And it was <laughs> really fun, honestly, yeah. <laughs> just talking. Absolutely. Just if any, uh, you know, person listening to the podcast is interested in talking about this, you can just, you can find me on Twitter as well. So you're at Nino underscore Kadic on Twitter. Uh, you run the Facebook 
Panpsychism Group and Panpsychism Page. All right, Nino Kadic, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>